Welcome to the Kim D. Davis Show. Here we'll talk to the leaders in technology, culture, business, and the arts. We'll cover politics, advocacy, motherhood, writing, mental health, and mostly we'll focus on hope. Join Kim B. Davis, author, playwright, radio personality, event consultant, professional speaker on the Kim B. Davis Show. Good evening and welcome to the Kim B. Davis Show. I'm your host, Kim B. Davis. And this evening, we have another one of our favorite guests. We have Dr. Angela Celeste May. We know her as our clinically, our organizational, and our forensically trained psychologist. She is also president of the Michigan Psychological Association Foundation Board, along with her own uh, her own, see, I messed it up just That's like all right. her own <laughs> firm and Celeste Music Productions. Did I get that right? Yes, yes, you did. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Angie. How are you? I'm fantastic this evening. This this near near Halloween evening <laughs> with my jack o' lantern. I yes. love your <laughs> jack o' lantern. So you know it's Halloween. Yes. And yes, we are still in COVID. It is a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, it and, sure does. And as I have said since the beginning of the pandemic, when this initially first started, this has really been a time of reflection. Lots mm -hmm. of people have reflected on their relationships, whether it be marriage, friendship, family, whatever it is, people are thinking about it. Is this working for me? Is this mm -hmm. beneficial? And so tonight I want to talk about toxic relationships. And so, you know, toxic relationships can be a lot of different things. And I'm going to let you define it because you're the expert. But I just want to give some examples and make sure that we're on the same page. And I understand what a toxic relationship is. So, for example, I have friends who holiday time is coming and they, they cringe. They're like, oh, I got to go to my auntie betty's for thanksgiving and she's gonna ask me oh baby you put some weight on and she gonna talk about me and i'm gonna feel bad and i'm gonna eat more than what i want to she gonna ask me if i have a, a boyfriend and i'm gonna say no or i'm going to lie and say i do because i don't want to feel the judgment and the recrimination that comes from that mm -hmm. or i have the <clears throat> sibling who is not as successful as the other siblings. And while the other siblings are talking about all the great things they did this year, this one sibling is sitting at the table like, well, I showed up. You know, my job is not as prestigious as yours. Maybe I don't have a title. Maybe I don't manage people or whatever it is, but I like what I do. But because mm -hmm. I don't have the, the, the outward things that people look at to view success, I get judged and I feel terrible when I leave this table. And then of course we have the typical abusive relationships where I'm in a, a romantic relationship, whether you're married or you're dating and someone is being abused physically or verbally or both. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, we'll have conversations as women and say, oh, I would never tolerate that. I would never be in a relationship like that. And if any of my friends were in a relationship, they would just automatically leave. But we never look at when people are in relationships, why did they get into that relationship in the first place? And why do they stay? A mm -hmm. lot of times it is not just black and white to say, because this person is being beaten physically, that it's easy for them to walk away. A lot of times they have normalized it in their own head that this, that this is what happens. And I say that because a lot of times we have friends and family and other people who bring us these examples that I've given you and say, this is normal. Um, mm -hmm. And the last one that I will give you, we have people who have, have surpassed certain circumstances in their family and are successful where you have the reverse where you have family members mm, here comes here comes sally yeah she's driving a a, a a lexus 
and she coming in here with her expensive handbag and yeah she's a vice president oh she thinks she better than all of us because she went and got her some college and so everyone makes you feel bad but because they're family or they're some tie to them we continue to subject ourselves to these experiences can you talk about that first by defining what toxic relationship are and then am I on the right track when I talk about that and how do we navigate some of those experiences you know that we that we feel that we have to deal with because Mm -hmm. they're family or because they're close associations wow well to your wonderful audience I think that we can say good night because (laughs) Dr. Kim has like hit all the boxes (laughs) right on the head thank you you're uh, you are you are so crystal clear like you know you hit out the ballpark exactly down the middle exactly everything that you said in terms of defining it um and examples of what it can look like um i will i'll start by saying that there's not a uh there are some terms that we use in our like lay language meaning out people who are not necessarily in the the field of psychology that is just like part of our part of our conversation, um, but it's not actually a formal definition. Um, I should say formal diagnosis. Sorry. So, like for example, a lot of people don't realize that the term insane is actually not a clinical term. There is no such thing as a diagnosis of insane of insanity. Mm-hmm. Insanity is a legal term. Mm-hmm. If you find someone insane when they, you know. It's Halloween, so what is it? Halloween's coming out. Is that with Mike? You know, Michael. And, you know, so if he's found insane, you know, that's a legal term. We would have other words for it, depending on uh, uh, defining and diagnosing what's what underlies that insane behavior. <clears throat> so, uh, toxicity in terms of a toxic relationship, same thing. It's not actually a formal diagnosis or diagnostic criteria attached to it. But we know what we mean when we say toxic and it's everything you just said. So um, I guess a formal definition of it would be if you are in a relationship with someone who uh, for whom you consistently and that's that's very important. That's key. Consistent Mm -hmm. with for with whom you are consistently being treated or felt feel that you're being treated in a way that uh, disrespects you on some level or makes you feel that you are uh, uh, less than appreciated or respected. Um, So what that can look like is you may not like someone, you may disagree with someone, you may have a real argument with, you know, all kinds of things, the way they live their life. And, you know, as a matter of fact, many of the things that you just gave as examples, but all that can be in place, but it not be a toxic relationship if the respect of persons is, is there. I don't agree with the way you're living, but I'm going to respect, I'm going to you know, tell you how I feel, but do it in a respectful way. Uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. So I, I feel that the consistency of the treatment and, cause there's toxic treatment that may not be in a toxic relationship for uh, what I mean by that is you may be in a relationship and maybe she or he tried it one time. Mm. It's a learning opportunity <laughs> to never try that again. It's a learning, you know, we have to let people know the boundaries. That's not okay. That's not acceptable. Uh, so being human, you know, toxic stuff can come up. I think really in defining it, it has more to do with how it's handled. Mm-hmm. And, you know, are you handling it with respect? You know, that that kind of thing. So um, I definitely would say that that's, that's a, a, a huge part of defining what um, a toxic relationship is. Uh, other things too, and, th- and this all falls under re- being treated with respect and being uh, feeling as though you're being treated with respect uh, or viewed as though you're respected. Um, another example of that would be, uh, I, I, I'm sure, you, I know you've heard people say this, I'll use this as an example, particularly in this age in which people are trying to erase the racist history of our beloved country Mm -hmm. and trying to write it out of the book textbooks and try to not teach it to children, particularly non-Brown children. 
um, pretend that we did not have slavery for you know several centuries in which people thought they could purchase humans and all those kinds of horrible things that went on. Um, in light of you know, in light of that, this is a, I think a, a perfect example. Um, you, you, you've heard people talk about in uh, people who were enslaved mm-hmm. who had consensual quote unquote consensual intimacy and relationships with people. Mm-hmm. Now we are human, so are we? We have feelings. It's very easy, you know, to be on the circumstance to to really and truly develop love for someone and all that. Mm-hmm. However. If the nature of the relationship itself is already unbalanced Mm -hmm. in terms of both people do not have the same sets of rights, I don't I don't mean within the culture per se, because sometimes you have control of that part, but within the relationship with each other, you cannot own a person. Well, I think we can agree. You really Mm -hmm. can't own people anyway. Right, right. The laws are written, but you know, if the law allows, you cannot own another person and then say that you have a consensual, mutually consensual relationship. The mm-hmm. two are mutually exclusive. So that's an example uh, in which it the toxicity may not be overt, but there's still the lack of a, a level of respect that has to do with allowing a person certain kinds of freedoms. Now, I mean. In hindsight, it's easy to sit here today and look back and say things like that. Um, in every situation, you know, there, there are unique situations that come up. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, just the kind of accepted idea that you can, um, uh, within your relationship, have one has more rights than the other within the relationship. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you cannot control the laws outside of that. Um, mm-hmm. That, that too is an example. No one may, maybe no one is abusing each other and maybe no one's, you know, doing anything like that may have very loving ways one to another, but still not allowing within, within the interaction uh, for both people to express, to be who they are, you know, et cetera. Uh, that too can be, I think, definitely part of the definition of a toxic relationship. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. kind of, kind of, Focuses on all that. Um, so we we already covered that you are Dr. Kim. So we have, we got number two. We know that you hit it on. You hit that right on the head. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, those examples that you gave, um, and in each of them, at least one of the parties. Sometimes it's like all parties involved, but at least one of the parties. And I think this is a definitely part of the definition too. Uh, you know, in your examples, felt that they weren't being heard, weren't being, dis- uh, weren't being hurt, weren't being respected, were being put down in some way. Uh, certainly if there's physical abuse, of course, and emotional, uh, were being dismissed, you know, in all of your examples. Um, so all of that comes under that heading of um, not being respected uh, or fully respected in the relationship. So all that's part of toxicity. Um, and then the third part of your question, what, what can we do to mitigate that in relationships in which you feel you have to be there? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think one of the, that, that's, a, that's such a good question. That definitely comes up, especially in holiday time, like you said. Um, I know that there are those who have taken the route, um, especially if they really feel it's just, it's just so toxic that they really, really have to remove themselves. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, that needs to be an option for some people um, in whatever way that that looks like, because uh, sometimes you are really putting yourself in harm's way, mm-hmm. emotionally, emotionally, if not physically, emotionally, all of those are ways in which you can be, you can be triggered really badly. And it's not, when I say not to the good, what I mean is it's not the kind of thing where you're in a safe space and things may come out and you can get them addressed or resolved or move things forward. And just uh, put in situations where you're just ex- just triggered and exposed and all of that. And you leave more traumatized than you walked in and all that. So on, on, the, on the extreme, maybe, you know, on one end of the spectrum, sometimes you really do. Uh, and it's not easy, especially when these are your loved ones to really consider uh, really consider maybe stepping away from that. And so for that example, mm-hmm. um, or, or for that circumstance, that might mean that, um, especially in this day and age of Zooming and virtual, that might mean that you check in 
on the screen virtually Mm -hmm. to say hi to everyone and you don't stay, (laughs) you know, let's Mm -hmm. give them your love, let them see each other. They may say some things or whatever. It's okay, you know. I sure did put on a little weight. You can tell. Okay. All <laughs> right. Hope you all are good. Love you. Still praying for you, whatever the case. And <laughs> and get off. So um, if you don't have access to technology, and before we had Zooming, what that used to look like was uh, okay, I'll just stop by just to drop off the just to drop off the pound cake. Mm-hmm. you know, and I'll have a backup. I'll have, and, and then, you know, people get very creative. So, you know, you have your friend drop you and, and sit outside of the car. I can't stay. <laughs> then we can get very creative with it. I, <laughs> you know, for, if you want to like, if you want to have some contact, you know, um, and, and that can help assuage some of your guilt a little bit, you know, so you don't feel guilty that you're abandoning as well as, you know, uh, relationships can be so intertwined and messy. We're still human uh, you know, it, it's it's amazing the resilience of the spirit and the strength of of loving bonds because we know that you can have uh, just like you said for an abusive relationship. Let's say it was the people who raised you, is your own parent, mom or dad or both, whomever who raised you, um, to for kids to still be able to have that love in their heart. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, a, a one option is to dip in and dip out. And literally, I, you know, people do this and I've advised people to do this sometimes. And people have told me how they've, cre- you know, came, come up with ways where they literally get, it's, it's like eight minutes, 10 minutes, stop by, hug everyone, that kind of thing. And it can be good for them if they need, they, they feel like they need to see them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that may be like op- option two on the, on the extreme range. Option one, you know, the highest level of toxicity and utter abuse and all that. So, and there are people who really do cut off. Mm-hmm. It, you know they just completely cut off and uh create you know as people say create their families from people who are supportive they you know create their own network of supports around them um so yeah certainly there are people who haven't seen their families in years and years and years um i you know personally and, and professionally i sometimes i i, I think that that i don't sometimes i think that can, that can be a shame it depends the mm-hmm. reason i say that is because um uh it I think there are ways to to maintain distance for your health and well-being and survival, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, do it in a way where there can be some opportunity for reconciliation if if such an opportunity may arise, because Mm -hmm. people do change, people Mm -hmm. do grow, people Mm -hmm. do realize some things. Um, So I I think it can be a shame if it's so completely cut off that you never give the other person a a chance Mm -hmm. for for that and where that can really hit home and like punch you in the gut is when people are passing yes. and, yeah. you know, and, and that opportunity is gone. So um, I, I think that that's each individual's decision, of course, you know, to think about it and based on what they, what they're dealing with and the toxicity of that relationship. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, you just have to really step away mm-hmm. uh, completely and, and have little to no contact or whatever the case. Um and then, you know, coming, you know, from that ex- kind of extreme to like navigating the, the rest of that range where you are not cutting them out completely. Um, I, I think in all cases, actually, I'll say this, in all cases, uh, I really believe that and know that trying to understand the other person's perspective as much as possible can really help with that. So um, I, I, one way to remember it, I guess, to think about it is like, the ABCs. I've, I've come up with ABCs. <laughs> Let me see. Okay, here's the ABCs. ABCs of toxic, toxic relationship. Um, uh, okay, so ABC. So A, as far as understanding, trying to understand the other person, and let me back up to say that it's important to try to understand the other person because um, in the word relationship indicates that it's more than one person. Mm-hmm. unless we're talking about one's relationship to oneself. So mm-hmm. since we're talking about one's relationship, because that's important. Too. Well, since we're talking about, you know, two or more people, um, whatever the other person is doing, good, bad, and different, or whatever the case, because there, there are two people involved in that back and forth in that communication, um, 
whatever they do, we have, we may not have that control over what they say and do, but we do have control over our responses to it. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so that, which is important. It's important to remind ourselves of that. So these ABCs have to do with um, working to try to understand as much as possible why they may do what they do and which can be helpful in our choices of responses to that. Mm-hmm. So A is for anger. Mm-hmm. So, anger. so anger oftentimes is a mask for depression, mm-hmm. bereavement, you know, pain, grief, loss, all of that. Uh, but anger, um, a lot of times, now this is not to say that we don't have our own responsibilities within the relationships because we do. And it's also not to negate um, in, you know, anyone's feelings. But if another person's angry, I think it's very, very important to ask this question mm-hmm. of two people. Why are, you know, what's going on with them mm-hmm. that they're angry? And is there anything that I'm doing that's triggering that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's important. It's very important because there are so many times that we just don't see it. It's like, we don't mm-hmm. understand what, what, you know, and we really may be doing something that is just absolutely really difficult for them to deal with. Um, so I think under trying to step in the other person's shoes as much as possible, trying to understand why they're responding as they are. Um, I'm not saying that that fixes everything, but it can increase our empathy a little bit Mm -hmm. for the other person. And because we're asking it of both them and ourselves, Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it also can help with, um, our being willing, because you have to be open and willing to even ask that question of yourself. Mm-hmm. Easy to ask about the other person. What's their problem? What's her? What's his problem? But mm-hmm. did I do something? Um, that's important because the healthiest of relationships, as we know, you know, needs consistent watering and feeding, and you know, help along the way. It's, it takes work, so uh, it's important to ask because that does help not only increase our empathy, but also um, it may help make some changes in how we interact with the person, you mm-hmm. know, and, and gain a better understanding. So A is for anger. Um, if they're very angry, if we are, you know, that's often a key part of toxic relationships. Um, and, and anger doesn't come out of nowhere. It's based on something. So I would say it's, it's very important in any relationship. I will put it this way. Think of all, I would say to anyone, think of the, all the best relationship advice and apply it to toxic relationships. <laughs> so. And then it'll be interesting, like what comes out of that, but it can really help get clarity on what's going on. And then with more clarity, hopefully a bit more empathy, you still can make some decisions about what you need to do to uh, mitigate that toxicity. So uh, what I was thinking of just now, and I was thinking about, you know, some of the best relationship advice, if you, uh, things like listening Mm -hmm. to each other, if the other person's toxic or the family members are toxic, they may not be very good at listening. But when, and it does take a bit of work because we have feelings after all. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's good to do, to try to do some of this before you go to Thanksgiving dinner, like before you see them to do some of this work, (laughs) just Mm -hmm. think about it, jot some things down. Um, When people ask, like as an example, not everyone, but when, you know, when that family member asked that question of, you know, it looks like you're putting our weight. Okay, so that can mean a few things. <laughs> and, and often what happens is it's, it's exactly like you described it. Uh, it's usually for different families. It's, a, it's like that same script. Like you pretty much know which things they're going to hit, which is what you said, like relationship or whatever this thing is, you know, that's one of the reasons that people roll their eyes when it's time to, you know, see each other, you know, go to the family dinner or whatever. Because, you know, I already know they got, because it's, you know. So mm-hmm. if they keep harping on it, there's a reason for that. Uh, let's not, I would say, let's not just stop at, here we go again. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, let's start to look at why a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes it's just to to be mean and to rattle you. Mm -hmm. Now, as a psychologist, you know, I tell people to do what they are. So I was like already a psychologist before, because, (laughs) because, you know, you know, interested in the behavior and dig up under that. So if somebody wants to rattle you, See, my question, my next question was, why? Why Mm -hmm. is that so important? Is it jealous? Are you jealous? Are you threatened by me? Um, 
you know, uh, are you trying to get back at me for something that happened years ago? Like we talked about in the previous show. With you, my red truck. you took my red truck in 1977, Dr. Angie, and I'm still mad. Exactly. And I never gave it back. I never. <laughs> it's in the living room now. Exactly. exactly. Hey, exactly. Hey, hey, truck. You won't exactly. give it back. I'm hurt. I won't. I'm planting geraniums in it. <laughs> exactly. Desecrated. Hey, okay, exactly. So um it, it, you know, every family is different, every relationship is different. Some, you know, some things you can do, some things you, you may not be able to do. But I definitely would say, you know, before Thanksgiving or well before, depends on when you want to open that can of worms. Uh, and you may not do it all at once, but try to get at the red truck, like what's really under that. And, and, you know, try to, if you can work on it with the person in some kind of way, that would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some, there are some families, some folks, you could just really have that argument and hash it out and, and finally get to it. And, and the roof not falling. Other mm-hmm. families, the roof's going to fall. <laughs> some mm-hmm. people have done it um, in my own family that, you know, there have been a couple of letters written. A couple different members that said, "Oh, that's straight." Like, let me just. Oh, wow. let me just. <laughs> <laughs> oh and, you know, it doesn't have to be a knockdown dragout. Sometimes it just, you know, write it. You know, it, it, if you feel that you, you know, if you can make that contact or start to work on that. So that that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know we think about it at this time of year, but ideally, you know. Uh, my advice would be, although we're psychologists, not to give advice like that, but the advice would be um, to work on those things year round if you can, mm-hmm. you know, start to make a few inroads. You know, I know people who, uh, you know, friends and, and family and, and acquaintances and stuff who've told their stories about how they address something. You know, so, so, uh, once a couple, there was a sibling, sibling, uh, brother and sister you know, issues from childhood and uh, one of them came in, came in town and basically I think she came in town and invited invited her brother to dinner and they just had it, they had to have this conversation, you know? So, um, so I would say, don't wait if you can. And if you typically put it out of your mind and don't think about it till holiday time or whatever, that may not be the time to open it all up. Mm-hmm. But it can be a motivator to maybe make some plans, resolutions, or make some plans mm-hmm. for the new year. Maybe wait till after the new year to, you know, to start to address some of that stuff. So that possibly next holiday, it won't be start working on something. So that that's, you know, but try to understand their anger. Try to understand what, what might be behind that, what's under that. Um, forgiveness is important also. It's hard to do any of this work when you're still carrying all that. So. Um, and, and I mentioned also under anger is often a mask for other emotions too, like depression, mm-hmm. feelings of loss, you know, stuff like that. And, and if they're carrying that or if you're carrying that or whatever the case that you're still carrying it. So we need to do something positive with it. So A is for anger. B is for, I, I kind of mentioned this and that is uh, bereavement. When I said that anger could be a mask for depression or bereavement. So um, bereavement doesn't always mean, uh, as we know, um, physical loss as far as someone passing, although that's part of it, of course, mm-hmm. um, but a loss of status, loss of position in the family. Um, you know, feeling B, uh, B can be for betrayed, feeling betrayed, that little red, you know, <laughs> A little red truck, you, you betrayed me. I'm your friend <laughs> in the second grade, <laughs> whatever you know. Um, uh, it can be for bereaved. I, I like jotted a couple of those bereaved, betrayal, and and bias. Oh, yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of these things. And you even touched on that because you know, like I said, you checked all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Dr. Kim just checked all of them. Bias, um, bias against, you know, uh, the one who's not, you know, doesn't have a title at work, the bias against the one who, who does have a title or whatever the case, when people, you know, I never forgave her, you know, 15 years ago because she married outside of our race, or our culture, or, you know, so, um, uh, j- just the, really, I think trying to start looking at uh, and naming, as much as you can, the baggage, like well, the baggage is carried. What's under? Don't always just say, "Well, here's what they do every year." Mm-hmm. Let's get to why. And a- a- having said that, a lot of times people will say, "Well, I already know why. She's just mad because of that time when blah blah blah." You might be right, 
number one, mm-hmm. or you might be assuming, did you ever have that conversation with him or whatever the case? Mm-hmm. Um, if you are right, it still sits there. So again, going back to this idea that you, you may not be able to control all that they do, um, you know, how do you, how do you handle that if it is still sitting there? Um, one way would be if you do know, or you think, you know, and, and maybe they've yelled into the top of their lungs, you know, I'll never forgive you that time. And so you think, you know, um, th- there is apologize. <laughs> it's an option. Mm-hmm. It's an option. Now, a lot of people will say, I have nothing to apologize for. So apology can look a couple of different ways. One, it could be, you know what, uh, in all honesty, I, I I didn't either, I didn't mean, if that's, if it's true, you don't want to make up lies, you know, I didn't mean for that to happen, or I didn't mean for it to blah, 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 whatever, or you did mean for it to be, but I'm, I've grown since then, I am sorry that, you know, I, I really shouldn't have at the time, whatever, or I meant for it to happen, and I think I should have, <laughs> and I think I was right. <laughs> No, you took my truck in 1977. I'm still mad. <laughs> you said, now, while I can't ever give it back to you because it has geraniums, in it, <laughs> there's also, of course, the apology, the apology for, you know, uh, I am I'm so sorry that this uh, did such detriment to our relationship. I didn't mean to upset you like that. I just, you know, I had a match set and I needed a third red truck. So... Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can ever forgive me. No, no. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I tell you what's, what's healthy about that psychologically. What is good about that is th- it may not resolve everything and he may still or she may still say no, like you just said. Mm-hmm. But there can, there can be a lot of air let out just by saying this stuff, mm-hmm. you know, even if it's not fully resolved. And it's, it's amazing how... Uh, oftentimes, as what ha- as happens in relationships and with human growth, you may not see it right then and there, mm-hmm. but having aired it or put it out or out there or talking about it or saying, you know what, I, I I'm so at the very minimum, maybe I'm so sorry that you're so upset about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that's if that is true, mm-hmm. uh, that can really it can do a lot for both parties. It can do a lot for the party who's hearing it even if you don't see it and even if they're still upset, which they may be, and it can do a lot for you just kind of like, you know, airing that. So A is for anger slash depression, possibly B is for bereavement and bias and other, other named baggage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, C can be for a lot of things. I'm not gonna go through the whole alphabet, but I was gonna do A, B, and C. So C, uh, it's interesting how the ones that you, the examples that you gave, all of them really fit C, which I was thinking about, um, this idea of being cheated, <clears throat> feeling cheated, mm-hmm. cheated in life. Um, and, and these all kind of overlap too, because uh, sometimes people are grieved or bereaved because they, they're, uh, they're angry about things that they did not get to do and they're watching you do them, mm-hmm. you know, or they feel that they've been, you know, held back or whatever. A lot of that happens in families so often, you know, or oftentimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, it's how you deal with it. Um, so for the toxicity that can come out when, when that's the case, that feeling cheated, again, that idea of trying to understand what, what's under their reactions to you and hopefully understand that a little bit better will help, again, grow your own empathy towards them. It can be uh, a lot of times we feel less like being angry back at them if we realize that they're really uh, feeling cheated because you were the one who had the family and all of that, and they never got married and that was, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think the ABCs all have to do with, uh, a list of some different things emotionally that are often, often underlie many toxic relationships. Um, they're not that they're all under it, but those are some of the, the most common, uh, things that, that are there, you know, anger about whatever depression, feeling a loss, uh, cheated out of an opportunity, all of those kinds of things. Um, so yeah. And then the latter part of the alphabet, we have X, Y, Z. So, uh, I don't know if we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but we will do X. (laughs) X. Oh, before we do X. So from my book, Freedom, uh, in, in the, in this book, 
when uh, the people that I interviewed talked about, you know, um, places in their lives, called, it's called freedom. What is the experience of living without negative self-imposed limitations? Mm-hmm. So the people that I interviewed for this book and for the study that I did, uh, as I've said in the past, you know, come from different backgrounds. They were men and women. Um, you, we know in this in this country, you know, you're either you're white and black, and we know there's mm-hmm. that doesn't cover the true diversity of our ethnicity. But white folks, black folks, uh, generations every everywhere from uh, early 20s to in the 60s, <clears throat> just a broad range of experiences. But all of them, you know, all this time I've been saying all of them uh, except one. <laughs> And uh, she was amazing because I did this for my uh, master's thesis and uh, then turned it into, I was encouraged to turn it into a book, which I did publish it. And for my master's thesis at the Center for Humanistic Studies in uh, here in Detroit, Michigan, it's now the Michigan School for Psychology. Uh, <clears throat> two of the pioneers in the field, in the, you know, there are different schools of thought in psychology. So in the humanistic uh, school of thinking and that whole movement, um, uh, Sarita Perry is one of the, the initial key uh, people in, who helped establish and move forward the, that whole school of thought. So Sarita Perry, she's a black lady. She reminded me of my grandma a lot. Very confident woman. And uh, I have the distinction. I was I'm the only person I was told uh, for whom she ever sat for uh, a student thesis. So she allowed me to interview her. Yes, she did, and and I'm I'm sure that that is uh, in in um, that I can credit and thank my wonderful uh, thesis advisor and supervisor, and who you know continued to be a wonderful friend. He and his wife, you know, um, after that, after being a doctor, you know, when I went on to my doctorate, came to my wedding, all that stuff. He was amazing, uh, Doctor Alvin Ramsey. Uh, he's known as uh, Doctor Umbaye Ramsey. Amazing brother. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Um, Harvard, Afrocentric psychology is fantastic. But anyway, um, as we do in research, all of the names of the people that I interview, you know, you change their names, protect their identity. So, of course, Dr. Serena Perry was like, you know, don't change my name. It's Dr. Serena. <laughs> I will now tell you what my experience is. And she didn't do it like this because, you know, she was all the very stately, mm-hmm. you know, kind of stately and kind of matter of fact, like, mm-hmm. this is what we do. So, she was the uh, only person who basically, she was wonderful to interview, but she she basically had, uh, she does remind me of my grandma. She had, there was, there were, there was no period in her life in which she wasn't free. <laughs> there, there was none of that. <laughs> so she was wonderful to include because she got from such an early age, the way her mother and what her mother instilled in her and her father, uh, the way she grew up, just a, such a sense of self that she carried with her even being an, uh, a black woman, you can imagine in, in the earlier days and decades of the last century, uh, mm-hmm. which society didn't want to recognize it, but basically they had no choice because it was Serena Perry. She was Dr. Serena Perry probably at five, <laughs> four years old. <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I mentioned the book because for, for all of them, uh, it, well, I was gonna say except for Serena, but including Serena, they, she knew it like all along, of course, but they all came to a point in the research. You know, we we started with uh, times when they felt most limited in their lives, uh, whether it's relationships or their career, self-esteem issues was a, a, a major thing that was weaved throughout with each person in different ways for different reasons. Um, and then we went through um, how they began to realize that they were living in a very limited way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then their progression in, into how they were able to find freedom and, uh, didn't mean they were free at all, you know, no problems in their life, but free from those self-imposed limitations where they thought that they couldn't be or do and realize that they really could. <clears throat> and in that, that journey, that, you know, interview process and they're telling their stories, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they all talked about, um, realizing and recognizing and being able to separate the toxicity of other people in their lives Mm -hmm. and themselves. Learning a part of that journey to freeing themselves from negative self-imposed limitations, which often uh, came out of toxic relationships, you know, parents or whatever the case, um, they they began to realize that um, they didn't have to take on or take ownership of the other person's negative issues. And that's something that was, that's, 
you know, was pretty consistent. So uh, for, for many people. So I would say to the theme today, going into the holidays and beyond, um, I think one of the most, well, I would say, I'm not, I think one of the most important things that people can do when you do need to deal with that those family members, those folks, and those relationships that you feel are toxic, um, one of the most important things you can do is to work on trying to separate and recognize how much maybe their stuff that's spilling, that's being aimed at you, their own pain, their own bereavement, their own whatever, and, and to take responsibility again, how much may, may actually be yours. Uh, if I put on some pounds and you notice I put on some pounds, yes, you're right, I did put on some pounds. <laughs> now, did I want you to take a bullhorn? And tell everyone. Did I need you to do that? <laughs> no. No, not did not. Not. <laughs> But uh, I know that there are parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who may not uh, have the most, how should we put it, emotional intelligence in terms of understanding how to, how not to announce that they're, but may really be saying it out of concern. Like they really might be scared for you. Like they really are, um, they've really been praying for you to have a relationship. So that's important also to um, be careful when we're defining what's toxic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the intention may not be, but the delivery is, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes people really are saying, sometimes people will say it in, in public in front of everyone uh, in their mind, you know, to embarrass you into making changes because they're so, you know, they want so much for you to have whatever they think they're thinking. Doesn't always mean that they're right about it. But again, the, just circling back to that idea of trying to understand as much as possible where they're coming from, it not only can help towards more empathy, uh, more empathy for where they're coming from, maybe of some more understanding of where they're coming from, which can equal hopefully less stress when they're coming from that place, and, and maybe even redefining uh, rela the relationship. Uh, it, sometimes it really is as toxic as you think. Sometimes it's more toxic than you think, but sometimes they may not, again, it's not so much that they're being toxic. This is how they love. And, you know, someone said to me recently, they, they, they realized that they need to learn to accept the way that their mother loves, mm -hmm. you know, um, because personalities differ. It may not be what you wanted, but, you know, she's doing the best she can, or this is what she has to offer. And, you know, maybe my part, my part in the relationship is to figure out how to accept it, that for what it is. It doesn't mean that you can't still grow in the relationship, but that's a good starting place, mm -hmm. you know, so that's mm -hmm. some stuff. <laughs> that's a lot. Okay. So let me see if I can unpack this because okay. one of the things that stood out to me, which I tell people all the time, how you respond to things is everything. So if you Absolutely. don't give something energy, it can't grow. And a lot Absolutely. of times, as I've told my children, I say to them all the time, when people talk about you, typically they're talking about themselves. You know, they will say, oh, you know what? You don't know how to do that. Well, why do you care? Does it have anything to do with you? More than likely, they're talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're correct. When we start to look at family members and relationships, when people say things to us, where is that actually coming from? Exactly. But mm -hmm. I want to stress this because I've seen this happen. And I was so happy that you brought up, you know, when people pass away, that's when we see drama. And, oh my goodness, yes. And, and, you know, I've seen this more often than not where people will be arguing and then someone will die unexpectedly. And then the person that they were arguing with who's still left here now is just torn apart. They're angry because mm -hmm. they don't, they can't go back at this person. They can't apologize. This person can't make it better. They're gone. And now you mm -hmm. are stuck in whatever state you were in, especially when it's a parent. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and it's funny because I, and I've seen this, this, this repeat itself over the years where people have gone to a funeral. My mother never loved me. My mother, she couldn't stand me. 
well, if your mother was doing the best that she could, or your father was doing the best that he could, and they didn't know how to show love because they were dealing with their own trauma, Mm -hmm. which unfortunately that trauma was so great for them. They never overcame it and they've Mm -hmm. passed it on to you. And now it's your job to decide, do you want to live in this same trauma and pass it on to the next generation? And I think sometimes people forget that and we don't realize how much control we actually have. Absolutely. I, I wanna go back to something that you said when you talked about people cutting people off. And mm-hmm. I've had a few conversations with people who've been molested by family mm-hmm. members. and that has to be a terrible, traumatizing, life-changing experience because it changes everything about you. And I remember one woman saying to me, she hadn't told her mother. She said, I was grown. She said, I had children of my own and I went to a family reunion and my abuser was there. Mm -hmm. And she said, I immediately went back to that, you know, seven, eight, nine-year-old child. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that she said that stuck out to me is she said you know we have this in 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 certain communities but especially in America not just in African-American communities but in a lot if an adult tells you to do something you do it Mm -hmm. and a lot of times when we're talking about molestation, that's how it happens because it happens with someone who we trust. They tell us what to do because they're older, more mature, or have some type of authority over us. We Mm -hmm. believe, oh, this is what we're supposed to do. And then somehow this behavior gets normalized until you realize or is taken out of that situation where you realize that it's not normal, that this is actually abuse. And lastly, when you talked earlier about, um, especially during slave slavery, when, mm-hmm. and historically we have these stories where people will say, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and I, I forget, I just, I just drew a blank on her oh, name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the sl- his slave, who was his mm-hmm. wife's half sister, that they mm-hmm. had this consensual relationship. And I've sat at tables where we've had historians come in and talk about it and people are angry because they will say to the historian who's telling this story, who oftentimes, you know, does not look like me and who will say, well, they have this love affair and people will say, she was 13, she was a slave. How does she have a love affair with her slave master? And so I do think it is important to put those uh, different scenarios into their proper context. Exactly. Because when we look at it, even if we look at modern day times, when we look at arranged marriages and mm-hmm. we see immigrant families that come over and I've done work in uh, family programs, specifically foster care. And we would have families who would come to us and the women would say, my children were taken away because the judge said, either you leave your husband who's beating you or I'm taking your kids away. They're like, but I have no money. I have no job. This is not my home country. I, I am depending on this person to help me, but I'm staying in this toxic relationship, this abusive relationship, because this is what right now is best for our family. And I use that word um, with caution because that's their perception. That's their viewpoint. I want to turn it over now to, and, and, and I, I always cringe whenever people say victim mentality, because you can believe that you're a victim, you know, as you said earlier, people can feel bereaved or grieved that they are missing out on something in life, that this person has more than them and they don't understand why this person has more than them and why they didn't have the opportunities that they had. Mm -hmm. However, you have some people that willingly participate in the foolishness. 
and and I will call it foolishness where you you have these conversations. I know I'm going to grandma's house, but her macaroni and cheese is great. And I'm going to have me some turkey and some sweet potato pie. And they can talk about me and call me fat all they want to. But guess what? My fat butt goes sit at the table and I'm going to eat up all the food. <laughs> and you're like, okay. you So you're calling yourself fat. You know, when you get there, they're going to talk about you. But then you're going to call me in two days and say, hey, Kim, it's Saturday. I need to tell you what happened at my granny's house and what my cousin said to me. Girl, can you believe she called me fat? Well, you just called yourself fat a couple of days ago. What? I, I, I'm a little bit confused. Or my favorite, I love Hallmark, Hallmark Channel movies. And what are they always having Hallmark movies? The girl comes home, she's not dating anyone. So what does she do? She hires an actor. And the parents are like, oh, you hired <laughs> Every time. Every time. How is it right? And they're always surprised. like, how dare you lie to us? And I'm like, because y'all keep bragging on her. Like the story is always the same. And I, I, I get caught up in it every time. So I'm a beggar to my own demise. You sit there, you watch it and you're like, but it's the same thing. You are criticizing this person, whether girl or man, I mean, uh, woman or man, who, because they haven't found the right person, they feel the need to fake it and bring someone home. And I've seen it with both. I've seen it with a man and I've seen it with a woman. And I always crack up every time because I'm like, okay, how are they going to find out this time? That, you know, <laughs> right? right. But what would you say to people who participate in it yet still complain about it because they don't quite know how to get out of it and is there really such a thing as being a, a true victim of a situation and i mean outside of abuse because we know that if you're in an abusive relationship and you're not able to leave for a variety of reasons yes you are a victim but I, I mean, in terms of where people say this person has a victim mindset. Uh, I, well, I think that um, the place to start <clears throat> with that question is the um, defining mm -hmm. what we mean by victim mindset. Mm -hmm. So victim mindset, a lot of times when people say it, they mean um, uh, it's, it's like the psychological um, like fences that we put around ourselves where we forget that we used a key word earlier, choices, choice. We forget that we have choice. Mm -hmm. We become convinced that we don't have choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, a victim mindset is no matter what happens, no matter who's doing what, um, it's always that uh, I'm helpless to do anything about it. <clears throat> I help help us to fight that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of that's part of the victim mindset. So your question is, is there such a thing as a true victim mindset outside of an abusive relationship? Yes. Uh, I, I would say yes, because this is the thing to keep in mind. There, as I tell, like, you know, when I'm teaching, teaching classes and stuff, psychology classes, different um, when we come to that section, that chapter on abuse and, and the different, there are different forms of abuse. Um, you know, there is, we now have, you know, it's not new, but we've named elder abuse, just like we have child abuse, spousal abuse, there's mm -hmm. financial abuse. Um, we know that there's physical, there's psychological, mental abuse. And what I always say is that um, in all of those different categories, even with, including with the most severe of physical abuse, sexual abuse, like all that, mm -hmm. um, unless you're stealing behind someone's back and they don't know that you're committing financial abuse against them, mm -hmm. which can happen. But even sometimes, even in those situations, what I was going to say is mm -hmm. what they all have in common usually is psychological abuse. Mm -hmm. The emotional abuse is, is like always part and parcel of that. Mm -hmm. And the emotional abuse is, is th that can be really uh, some of the most devastating. Mm -hmm. because, and so I think that's important to keep in mind because people think that if the physical abuse is not there, that a person is not actually mm -hmm. fully being abused. Mm -hmm. You can always walk out the door. Mm -hmm. And what the best, and I say that, I say that, you know, 
quote, what the, the, I won't say best, people who are most effective at abusing others are the ones who can, and this is typically the trajectory anyway, Mm -hmm. they get your mind first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once you get the mind, Mm -hmm. you know, people uh, can be subject to all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. As we're seeing now in this cult in which people are literally uh, not only endangering their lives, but Mm -hmm. allowing their children to unnecessarily die, Mm -hmm. you just Mm -hmm. get their mind, you know, Mm -hmm. get people convinced of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, even in the most uh, horrific physical uh, relationships, um, that the the physical part of the abuse is, you know, another insurance policy to make sure they. So that's when we have those examples of people who, uh, uh, you know, the person is so assured that they have the 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 person they've been victimizing uh, under their thumb that they will be gone for eight hours. And they know that they're not going to go anywhere because psychologically and mentally they have them so locked down. So I would say most definitely there's a lot of abuse going on in which nobody, with true victimization, which no one touched anybody. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. They, they, yes, they do have choice. Um, but if they're convinced that they don't, then again, it's that mental trap mm-hmm. to, that, that needs to be broken. Um And a lot of times when that's broken, like let's take just for a quick example, two women who are in a very similar situation or two men who are in a very similar situation where they really are being, I hate to say really, where they're being physically abused and threatened and and the threats are real and all that's true. Mm -hmm. One person, both of them have emotional abuse as well. They're really like bowed psychologically. One of them begins to recognize that they actually can create some choices for themselves because as long as you th- as long as you think that you can't you're not going to look mm-hmm. and it's a danger to look it's, it is a danger it's a real and true danger to you know to your life but the person in the situation who begins to think or begins to recognize that maybe they can't figure out a way out of this will start to work on it mm-hmm. and it may take time and it is a dangerous prospect mm-hmm. but that's when they can start making plans or saving money or talking to somebody when nobody's looking or whatever the case and start push whatever they do to push against that. Um, So even in though, even in the most physically abusive relationships, you need the mental part. Mm -hmm. You've got to get that, that, that belief in the mind that something can possibly change some kind of way. So if you take the physical abuse part away from it and you have, again, somebody who's, uh, feels that they are a victim and they really believe that they are, you got to work on changing that mindset and showing them. Um, so to your example about the person who puts themselves down, it's a couple of things. One is what we, what we normalize. It's, it's exactly like you said, what's normalized in their relationships. And they may have, have, have this may have been modeled to them. They may have seen their folks do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You, you, you don't want them to put, put you down. You fuss about being put down, but then you put yourself down. It's a way of, um, it's like you said earlier, you're continuing that. This is how I was treated. This is how I think I'm supposed to be treated. So this is how I treat myself. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Right. And I think that's a mistake a lot of times people, people make as they assume, well, that can't possibly hurt you because you're doing the same. We do things that hurt ourselves all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really causing us harm. Mm-hmm. So uh, we we self-inflict on us what other people inflict on us. People do it as a way to, uh, you know, offset the pain to make excuse for it. There's something else I just want to throw out there too. And that is a lot of times it's not so much that it doesn't really hurt. Uh, for example, um, you know, I, the, those triggers for overeating and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, it really does hurt when they point that out or he or she points that out, but I'm going to sit down and eat more. It's, it's, sometimes it's not as cut and dry as either, or it really does hurt. But what's more important to me or the way I fight back is to show that I'm free. To, I, I, you can't make me stop eating. Mm-hmm. And so we just harm ourselves more. Mm-hmm. It's a vicious cycle. It's a it vicious is. cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So there, there's always that emotional, mental, psychological piece of it. And I, I think you already kind of gave part of the answer or a key part of the answer to try to help people start to unravel that and, mm-hmm. and get out of that vicious circle is when you when you don't just listen to them say, girl, let me tell you what happens. Cause they want to share. This is how they share. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's only sharing the family dynamic. You know, <laughs> let them share maybe or maybe not. But mm -hmm. like you said, but I thought you said, so why is that bothering you? Mm -hmm. it, it does bother them, but that's a real like, uh, uh, that's a real way to give people pause. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times people will just say, well, it's okay for me to say it. I just don't want them to say it, but is it okay for you to say it? Why is it okay if you put yourself down? Mm -hmm. Well, see, you're getting too deep now. Uh, <laughs> Kim, you're I'm not getting a therapy. Too deep. You get too deep now. <laughs> you're and not that's a therapy. The whole therapy session, but to confront them on that a little bit, to give them pause, like pull up mm -hmm. that mirror mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. see what they do, what they do with it. Mm -hmm. Oh. See, then they'll say, you're not Dr. Angie. You're, you're just <laughs> Dr. Davis. And I'll say, but I've been trained by Dr. Angie. No, no. Title, <laughs> Dr. So I'm Dr. Kimberly. Uh, you're Dr. Kimberly. It, 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 we're That's in touch. Right. Come on, let's go. <laughs> exactly. But, there you go. There but you go. I, but I, I think that self-reflection is very important. We have taught almost every show, Dr. Angie, about speaking positivity into ourselves yes. about not yes. talking down to ourselves you gave the great example on several of our episodes where you said think about the person that you love if it's your grandmother your child your spouse your best friend now what you just said to yourself would you say that to them if That's you true. go oh no i would never do that then you shouldn't be talking to yourself like that unless exactly. you are trying to build yourself up. That's right. I'm going to plug my, my computer in. Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, all of those things are, are very important. But one of the things that I want to leave us with, because we only have a few more minutes, is what are some things that we can do to strengthen our relationships? Because oftentimes, mm -hmm. and especially during the pandemic, you know, lots of people have said, I haven't seen my family. I haven't seen my friends. You know, some people are doing things, other people are not. And so as you come back together, you know, sometimes things are said and people are like, but I just wanted to see you. And mm -hmm. so I am going through all of the, the, the the bad things that are said or the insensitive things that are said or mean things because i miss my family or i miss my loved ones and then when they come through it they feel a little bit better and they're like mm, yeah my cousin was over there talking about i was fat again but you know that macaroni and cheese was everything and i was happy to sit with my grandmother so because i love my grandmother so much tell us some things that we can do to help strengthen our relationships, to keep them positive? Uh, well, we can start with the other, the, the other end of the alphabet, the X, Y, Z part. And X is for, although it's not spelled this way, exhale, it's yes. for exhale, <laughs> exhale. Um, exhale means to, uh, a lot of times people are afraid that if you're telling them to let something go, Mm -hmm. It means you're, it means that you're saying it's okay that they hurt me. It's okay. Uh, exhale. I don't mean, I don't mean don't work on writing the wrongs or working on the, you know, fixing some stuff or whatever the case or acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. But exhale means, first of all, just letting go of the expectation of stress. Because the expectation of stress, which you know, then leads to stress, is a habit as well. It's mm -hmm. part. That's all part of the way things are done. You know, every year. So, um, if you're still at a place, still meaning you have a chance to work through this, or people are you know resistant to working through, or whatever, you know, they're still going to say whatever the case. Um, no, know that's how your family is, and start now before you get there. <laughs> Just okay. So kind of exhaling. And part of exhaling also means um, it, it, it. forgiveness is important. Forgiveness doesn't mean you don't want to continue to work on some stuff, maybe later after the holidays or whatever. But exhale also means uh, giving yourself the gift of like uh, working on not getting stressed before. And sometimes that may be, you know, that may go as far as practicing a few Fact, practice some responses, practice some responses. So get in the mirror and just, yes, that's true. 
Well, why is that? You know, I don't know, but this pie is so good. You still not gonna give me the recipe? Because I know you know it. <laughs> so I, that has to do with don't fight back so so hard. Um, it, I, it's it's so powerful to go in there and say, you know what? I'm gonna really work this time and on letting it be about about them. I'm not gonna think about myself. I'm just gonna. How are you doing? And what's going on with you? Are you feeling better? How's that knee pain? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and just, and before you know it, oftentimes people will, you know, kind of forget about their usual whatever. So I think um, exhaling, practicing, working on not expecting to be stressed, you know, working on not stressing before. Acceptance is huge. Accepting people where they are doesn't mean they won't grow and change. Doesn't mean it'll always be this way. Uh, but for now, if that's where they are, accepting for the moment and celebrating what you can celebrate, mm-hmm. which is kind of like what you were saying, you mm-hmm. know, I don't appreciate that part, but I sure do enjoy the, that I get to be with, you know, sit with grandma or great aunt or whomever for a while. So mm-hmm. celebrate the positives that you can look and be conscious about it. Mm-hmm. Consciously look for all those positive things that can be, that can help. And if somebody puts you down or you view it as them putting you down, try this. Give them a compliment. Give them a comment. If you don't put them down back now for some families, uh, you know, getting a good, a few zingers going is how you do. That's how we do. <laughs> but, um, you know, just constantly look for the positive. Practice exhaling and just going in there to say, you know, commit yourself. I'm just going to go in there and just chill and enjoy our time because even if they're still mean, I'm going to work on forgiving them. I'm going to try to see why they do it and, and realize it's not always about all about me. Mm-hmm. And like you said, they may not be here next year. Right. They may not be here. next. That's, you know, my, my great aunt, every year my mom would be like, she may not be here. The woman was strong. She was, she was strong till a hundred, you know, almost hundred and two. But but even at but 102 and 112 does come around one day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think focus on your thankfulness. Enjoy what you can enjoy. Enjoy the people. Step away a little bit to just, you know, be thankful for what's there and try not to hold on so tight to the, the negative stuff. Even though it's real, maybe work, maybe, so, you know, I'll work on that later. But for today, let's, I'm just going to enjoy being together with them. Mm-hmm. So. That's some stuff to, to try to, and, and, and like I said, you may not always see it then, but it can really help with some relation with relationship stuff, like over time, mm-hmm. because they'll see that you don't respond the way you usually respond. That's the other thing too. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, people are, people give, you know, the back and forth is because of what they're used to. And they come there with expectations too. Mm-hmm. Well, someone's going to come in here again. She ain't got nobody, whatever. If you come in there and, and you may announce before anybody says it, hi everyone. I have nobody. <laughs> see i'm one for i'm gonna I'm I'm come at you in ways you didn't see me coming <laughs> and just let you kind of work with that mm-hmm. you know yeah mm-hmm. but but bring but you bring the positivity yeah. you, why do i have to do it because you said you were miserable so this will help you feel better so <laughs> you bring the positive count your blessings look be conscious and look for the positive things while you're there and celebrate being there, even with the stupid stuff, because there's a day will come when they're when when you're not able to be together. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah. you, Doctor Angie. I knew we came to the right person. You are our expert. Thank you for summarizing toxic relationships, telling us how to strengthen our relationships, how to be self-reflective, how we should make our choices, and always stay positive. Now, tell us about your book. Tell us about your music. Tell us about your practice. Tell us you've got a couple of coaching groups. I was going to say movie, but movies are a few months old. But tell us about those as well. And then whatever else you have going on, you you've got a lot. And then you have a doctoral coaching program going. Yes, on. I do. So, yeah, that so is you true. Tell us where we can find you, all your contact information, including your all your social media links. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for, as always, you always give me the opportunity to share all that stuff. So I'm very blessed to do things that I love to do, um, you know, all these different areas. Um, So as far as where you can find me, 
Um, I am president of uh, A M May and Associates Incorporated. So that's A period, M as in Mary period, and then M A Y, just like the month, and Associates Incorporated. Uh, it's a, co a company I have with my sister Michelle May, and we do counseling, consulting, and coaching. Um, you can find us at amaassociates.com. And on our website, you'll see our different um, uh, offerings as far as coaching and counseling, et cetera, is concerned. My sister is, is back into doing counseling under our umbrella, so that's wonderful. Um, as far as the coaching programs, we both do offer personal, professional, and creative coaching for our, our fellow creative professionals because we're both professional musicians. Um, as far as the creative part, whether your creativity is in music, dance, whatever it may be, if you're a writer, um, still we do some coaching with around that um, to help help with you move forward with your whatever your your practice maybe your coach your creative practice maybe, um, and then also consulting. I do for the company um, I do consulting for businesses, both profit and nonprofit. Um, as far as our coaching programs, we uh, both offer um, different, you know, different packages. So for myself, um, I do, uh, I have a coaching program that I call Manifest Your Success, and it's uh, life and doctorate coaching. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, personal coaching, professional coaching, creative professional, and then the doctorate, I offer coaching uh you know, different ranges depending on the needs of the person. So maybe my 90 minute, uh, 90 day, 90 day program, 30 day programs. This all depends on what the person may need. Um, so that's for doctorate students and also for people who are considering, you know, getting their doctorate. It doesn't have to be in the field of psychology, uh, which is my field, uh, but um, you may be going for your EDD, which is doctorate of education or doctorate in mathematics. It doesn't matter. Um, there are, I have mentored and been a, a dissertation chair for uh, people getting their doctorates in business, you know, all kinds of areas, because there are just certain things that all doctorate students, you know, certain hurdles that all doctorate students have to go through and, and all of that. So yes, please, please do contact me for that. Uh, my newest offering, which I'm very excited about, well, two things we've got going on currently. One is, um, we're, we have a, um, a women's mastermind power group. So it's powerful women who've been in their profession uh, at least five, five years or so, five, 10 years or more. Um, they may be entrepreneurs. They may be um, within someone else's company. That's just fine. But these are established women who in their own ways are leaders. Um, so that's why it's a power group. It's a coaching group that we have going on from now till uh, February, till the end of February. We meet every other week. And um, uh, yeah, we just offer coaching and some direction and, you know, things that folks are working on. So we're, we're in the middle of, well, we, that started in October. So we're going into November now with that. Um, but we will be offering that again, you know, okay. uh, in a new year. Uh, my sister is, uh, and I always help her kick it off as well. She's doing her second annual AMA, second annual retreat. It's a virtual retreat. For creative professionals. Uh, so that will be in January. Um, it's a, it's a three-day virtual retreat for creatives of all different kinds of backgrounds. And uh, when we did it the first time last year in January, it's a wonderful time to do it because, you know, it's kind of like setting you up for the year ahead, helping you with your goal setting and how to go forward and all kinds of stuff. So it's wonderful. People just got so much out of it. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. All that you can find out about on uh, at AMA Associates at amaassociates.com. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram, AMA Associates. You can also find us on uh, Facebook, AMA Associates as well. Um, and my program that I'm just, just about to launch, which I'm very excited about as well, is a stress management coaching group for Black men, specifically for Black men. Um, and that's something I've been wanting to do for a while because I, I'm, it, you know, it's about time. There's so much programming out there for women, for black women, for women of color, you know, way past time. It's, it's fantastic. I love it. Um, uh, but there's, I'm not seeing as much for men. There are, there are some things that I really wanted to uh, create something specifically around the stressors that black men in particular face. Um, we know, we know that that's a, that is a life issue for sure. And certainly in this time of racial reckoning and all of that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's just a certain sets of, of, you know, stressors that men who are raised in a, in a 
society like ours, you know, in general, regardless of the background, who are told that because they have tear ducts that they shouldn't be using them because, you know, after all, we wouldn't want to be human. Yeah. <laughs> You know, basic human emotions. Uh, I think we're getting away from that somewhat, but still, it has such an impact, uh, such a negative impact. Uh, the rates of suicide, the, I was surprised to find this out, the highest rate of suicide among, you know, different demographics within our country is white men, actually. Really? Um, yes. And there needs to be more research on the rates uh, for Black people in general. Mm-hmm. But I think that I, I mentioned that because I really think it's it's it just speaks so much to how much black men are not given the space and room mm-hmm. to emote and to deal with, you know, so, so many more stressors, you know. So uh, and, and also having worked with men just like down through the years, either as a clinician or uh, as their professor, mentored a lot of men um, in general and black men, definitely. And and they speak about these things. And when I bring this stuff up, so many men have had the same reaction. We need to do, we've got to talk about this stuff. You know, we need to be able to, you know. So it's wonderful to hear that attitude from more, more and more brothers, more and more black men, black and brown. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the stress management uh, coaching group for black men it will start on the 16th of November. Um, so uh, the reg- pre- early, early registration is going on right now uh, for $141. Uh, the, the full price is $235, so you want to take advantage of that. And again, you can go to AMA Associates. You can go to, uh, to, to click to register. You can also, again, go to uh, Facebook, the AMA Facebook page for that. So I'm excited about doing that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. On the music side, uh, Celeste Productions. Um, I'm trying to think. Did I cover everything AMA so far? I think yes. Okay. <laughs> Did, uh, on the music side, um, I uh, well, I well, I teach. Uh, I do teach music. I teach voice and piano uh, here in Detroit at the Mary Grove Conservancy through my company Celeste Productions. I um, I also I also coach musically fellow professionals. So if you are a professional musician, uh, whether you're a vocalist or whatever the whatever the instrument may be, I do coach, uh, do musical coaching as well. And sometimes that can be for a professional. They they know their stuff. They know their instrument. They know what they're needing to do. But um, maybe they're working more on finding their own vo- musical voice. And I don't mean literally, but their own unique stamp on what they're doing. Or maybe there's something about their connection with their audience and stuff like that. So I work on all those things as well with people. Um, I've, I've mentioned the last few shows about a project <laughs> that I am working on, and I'm finally putting the fin- finishing touches on uh, on that. So uh, probably not going to talk about that more until maybe the, the new year-ish or just before. I'm still performing. Uh, I've got a private performance coming up. I, I uh, do them sometimes for private fundraisers and stuff like that. Uh, so those are, pri- you know, people book me for private stuff. So I have some, some of those things coming up, but publicly I'll be performing uh, unless something comes up, I don't know if I'm doing too much before the new year. But anyway, I'm excited about all that stuff. Uh, the book, oh, and my albums, um, you, uh, Celeste Productions. Okay, you can find you can find me, Dr. Angela Celeste May. <laughs> so, Dr. Angela Celeste May on Facebook. That's my professional page for uh, uh, music related stuff. I have a YouTube channel as well, and that's Angela Celeste May in which I uh, have lots of content on, um, uh, what is it, a tip of the day for uh, vocalists and fellow performers and other stuff on there. So go to my YouTube channel. Um, My, uh, let's see, my my biggest thing, uh, as I mentioned, is the genres of music, uh, which has got like 35, 36,000 views or whatever it is. People love the genres of music. I explain and help people understand like what are the actual differences. But I have lots of uh, vocal, I call them vocal quick tips. That's a vocal quick tips. I also have that series. Um, so feel free to visit, drop a comment. And if you ask me to make a certain video on something, I may actually do that. Um, uh, follow me, you know, my personal Facebook is Angela Celeste May. Twitter is Celeste, C-E-L-E-S-T-E-M-U-S. So Celeste one, number one on Twitter. Um, and my uh, also go to Reverb Nation. So that's R-E-V-E-R-B Nation. And look for Angela Celeste May or Dr. Angela Celeste May. Angela Celeste May. Angela Celeste May. Um, and there you will find all uh, what I've been doing musically. Um, uh, uh, all of my, my two albums are there as well. You can buy singles, you know, et cetera, for the two albums. You also can buy my um, album, Reintroducing the Lady from Amazon. Um, I think they're both on iTunes as well, first and second album. Um, and then my book, my book, 
Freedom. Um, and that's available on Amazon also. Um, and uh, you, you know how this works. You know how your book shows up in like all kinds of stores in Germany and England. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so it's out there. It's out there. Definitely Amazon. It's on Kindle. Um, there's the paperback and the hardback also. Uh, I think that's most of everything. I think that's most of it. Yeah. <laughs> that's most of everything right now. Thank you, Dr. Angie, for Thank coming you. on, for sharing with us all the great things that you are doing. We always feel so privileged to have you because you always teach us Thank something you. new. And this is going to help someone get out of a toxic relationship or at least be able to navigate it so that they can have a good holiday and they can yes. begin to make those changes so that they can have stronger relationships. So thank you for that. We hope to see you next month when you'll have another exciting topic and we get to talk again. So thank you again for coming on tonight. Thank you for having me as always. Thank you. Thank you guys for tuning in to the Kimby Davis show. You know, I'm your host, Kimby Davis. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, everywhere on social media. And it's Kimberly Bachelor Davis. Bachelor is spelled B-A-T-C-H-E-L-O-R. You can see this show on youtube.com forward slash Kimberly Bachelor Davis. You can hear this show on Apple, Spotify, Google, and Stitcher. You can find out more about me as an author at KimBDavis.com. Thank you again for tuning in. And as always, remember, be magnificent.